wonderful that you don't want to stop talking to each other. Uh, I think that's a really good sign. Welcome, I'm Risa Golubov, I'm the Dean of the Law School. I'm so happy to see you all here. Uh, thank you to Dean Davies and everyone who made today and makes this week possible, and to Dean Falk and to everyone who brought you all here to us. It is wonderful to see you. So I've been thinking about what it was like to sit where you were sitting. Uh, and when I sat there at the beginning of my law school career, I did not imagine that my career would lead me to be standing here. I did not imagine that I would ever be uh, a law professor, the dean of a law school, or a scholar of lawyers. That part you may not know about me, but you'll learn a little bit more in a minute. So I thought I would talk a little bit about how I got here, not so much the nuts and bolts of it, which I'm happy to talk about at some later time if you want, but about the ideas of it and the conceptions, because what I've learned about lawyers as a scholar of lawyers, I think will help you all orient yourselves towards your law school career. That's what this day is all about, orientation. Um, and it's also an object lesson in the idea that law school is going to create opportunities for you that you can't yet even imagine. Some of you sitting here may think you know where you're going, and you may. Some of you may not, and may feel badly about that, and you shouldn't. Uh, you should expect your life and your career to change over time, and you should embrace the idea that careers are long and varied, and you won't likely end where you started or where you think you will end up. So when I began my scholarly career, I thought I would study how regular people made change in the world. And my very first law school uh, paper that became the dissertation that became my first book started out talking about regular people. It was about a group of African-American teenagers in the World War II South who were lured to Florida to harvest sugarcane and were virtually enslaved when they arrived there. And their parents wrote letters to the Department of Justice and to the NAACP trying to help their children, trying to get them back, trying to get them out of slavery, trying to get them home. World War II, by the way. That was not a, you didn't mishear that, slavery, World War II in the same place. Um, and the questions I was asking from those letters that I was reading was, uh, what happened to these teenagers? How did their parents argue to help them? Who were they arguing to? What does all this tell us about how they understood what their rights were at a time before the modern civil rights movement? These were important questions. They were in questions that I went on to answer. I thought it was really important to understand what happened, to capture their stories, to understand their own efforts on their behalf. But it quickly became clear that the story couldn't end with their articulations of harm and rights. They entered into various legal apparatuses. They made their claims to lawyers, black and white. And the relationships with those lawyers then became key to the fates of their children and to their own sense of rights and their own efficacy in the world. The lawyers decided whether to take their cases or not. The lawyers decided whether they would make arguments for them and what those arguments would look like. And what became clear to me was that the lawyers facilitated and mediated these people's interactions with the law, and in some cases thwarted their interactions with the law. Now, I was already in law school when I was doing this research, and I went to law school because I understood that lawyers had power. But I really never fully appreciated how much power that was until I started this project and started studying and realized how crucial lawyers are to the efficacy of regular people, to having their voices heard, to achieving their goals, and to helping them make change in the world. And so I became not just a scholar of the law, but a scholar of lawyers. Now, law is deeply connected to the rest of the world. It is deeply about people in every way. It's about politics, society, culture, economics. Cases exist because real people, like those teenagers and their parents, experience harms that they think the law can help them fix. But my focus has increasingly been on the power that lawyers wield as real people come to them. My second book was about a problem that had existed for hundreds of years for regular people, but lawyers had not thought it was a problem. And the book is all about how a group of lawyers go about recognizing what we call a legal problem and then changing it. So what's striking about these lawyers for, is that for the most part, they're not famous. 
and they're not unique. I'm not only talking about the Thurgood Marshalls of the world. I'm talking about every single lawyer who wields power by virtue of being a lawyer. So the question is, what is this power, right? What is this power to make law, to affect real people, real institutions, real companies, real nations, real economies? The law unlocks doors and enforces contracts. It puts people into prison and takes them out. It allows companies to merge and to go bankrupt. It creates treaties and it ends wars. But it doesn't do any of those things without lawyers, without people. Now, when you're, you're, you're going to start law school on Wednesday, I know, you're already started. You've already started your reading. Someone yesterday said to me, I was just catching up on some reading. I said, you can't be catching up, because catching up <laughs> presumes that you are behind. We haven't started yet. You can't be behind, right? Um, <laughs> you can't be. Uh, uh, but you are about the readings most of you have now been assigned are cases. And in the cases, you're reading what judges have written. And you're trying to figure out the rules judges have laid down. And you will be, for a while, very focused on judges. And what I want to say to you is, don't forget that behind every case is not only a judge, but a lawyer, usually two, at least, right? There are lawyers that make these cases. And the lawyers are not all powerful. They operate under many constraints. They operate in conjunction with clients, with other lawyers, with politics, with economics, with judges, with politics, with precedent, with procedures. I said politics twice, it must be important. Um, all of these, though, are people. And people make law, and you will make law. So this is all to say, law is not some constant, external, impersonal force out there in the universe existing in a vacuum. Law is made, not found. And it will eventually, routinely, momentously be made by you. I've been acutely aware of that as a law professor and now as dean, that my job is to ensure that you understand your power as you become lawyers and that you are equipped to deploy it with integrity and responsibility. So how does that happen? How do you go from the lay people you were last week to the lawyer <laughs> Daisha Dwin is, to the lawyers you will all be uh, going forward? How do you get initiated into a set of language, of forms, of procedures, of power? How does that happen? Well, we know how that happens. That happens here in law school over the next three years. And we know, you all know, you've seen enough movies, it happens in part by learning to think like a lawyer, right? That's a phrase you have no doubt heard. It's a phrase you'll hear in the future. You will learn to analyze problems, to think critically, to manipulate categories. You'll learn to persuade rather than disagree. I imagine at least some of you are here because as children, you were argumentative and people said, you should, oh, I hear the Twitters, yeah, you should go be a lawyer. Well, lawyers are not argumentative. That's not what we do. We persuade, we don't argue. Oh no, there's a big there's a big distinction there. And by persuading, we are using our best analytical reasoning. We are thinking like lawyers. But thinking like a lawyer is not all you will learn here, and it's not all you should think about learning. There are two other really important aspects to your legal education. One is experience. It's the experiential learning that you'll do in clinics, externships, pro bono work, negotiations courses, legal research and writing, summer jobs, alternative spring break. It's the real world experiences that you'll have with real people. Think about one of those parents of those teenagers walking into your office. How do you help them? What do you do? What kind of empathy do you feel for them? What does the world look like for them? And how can you make it a better place? The experiential learning teaches you integrity, responsibility, judgment. It can't teach you empathy. That's something you have to have, I think, although we'll talk about that again in a minute. Uh, but it enables you, it gives you opportunities to express your empathy and to figure out the best way to communicate it. The third part of your legal education is thinking big. It's, a, it's using a wide array of scholarly perspectives to foster the big picture 
thinking that is critical to leadership. It enables you to put the one-on-one -on -one interpersonal relationships into larger perspectives. When you sit in the boardroom and you encounter a deal, why this deal? Why now? What's going on in the economy that makes this possible or necessary or salutary for my client? Why has this social movement just erupted into the public spotlight right now? In order to be able to answer those larger questions, which will help you do the best both for your client and for the larger society, you have to know more than analytical thinking. You have to know more than experiential learning, more than the skills you'll need to take a deposition or make a deal. You have to know history, jurisprudence, economics, psychology, politics, philosophy, religion, sociology. That's what enables you to keep drawing on your legal education, not just in these three years, not just in your first job, but for the rest of your lives as you go on to be leaders in your own right. So you'll learn not only to think about how to manipulate set legal categories, but also to take ownership over what the law most fundamentally is. To think about not only what needs to be done in a given moment, but what can be done and what should be done, not only to practice the law, but to lead the law. In order to do that, you have to become partners in your legal education. And for those of you who are here on Friday, I mentioned this then. You are looking for mastery. You are not passive recipients consuming an education. My hope for you is that today will be the longest that you will sit in any room in the law school and be talked at for this length of time, right? I do not wish that on you. That is mostly not how you learn here. You are active participants in the process of your legal education so that you can become masters of the law and exercise the power that you are gathering here. So the best compliment I ever received um, in my 14 years of law teaching was in a teaching evaluation in constitutional law. Uh, and the person wrote, this is not just a class, it's a downright deep experience. <laughs> And I thought, that's right. And that's what I hope law school is for you. That's my goal, right? I, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean to say I assumed that was right. But that was what I wanted, right? I want you to come into the classroom. I want you to come into law school. And I want you to think, this learning isn't just about the doctrine that's in front of me. It's about mastering and being a partner and understanding the power that I will wield to challenge myself to own this material so that I can be the kind of person and who makes the law happen. So if that's what we're doing here, if we are endowing you with this immense amount of power, what comes with that? I think two important things come with that. First is opportunity. You can do literally anything. Okay, maybe not. We just watched the Olympics. Not anything. You are, you are unlikely. Maybe one of you is. Um, but you are unlikely to be Usain Bolt or Simone Biles. Uh, but, uh, but literally, the world is your oyster. And that is so exciting. Careers are long. They are not linear. No two are the same. I did not expect to be a Supreme Court clerk. I did not expect to be a law professor. I did not expect to be a law school dean. You will meet Daisha Dwin in a moment. I don't know exactly what she expected, but her career has been varied and interesting, and I would say long, but it hasn't been that long yet, and it's already an amazing, uh, an amazing and wondrous thing. And your careers will be that way too. And I know that you sit here and you're a little nervous, and you're not quite convinced that it's going to be wondrous and amazing, but I'm going to tell you that it is. And I know that because I have watched 14 classes of of you before and watch what you all have done in the world. And I know that our students are clerks and they practice in nonprofits and in government, that they're CEOs of hedge funds and they're heads of legal aides and they're US attorneys and they're Congress people and senators and presidents and judges. And even if you want, you could become the New York Times puzzle master like Will Shorts, who was our graduation speaker last year and a graduate of this law school. But seriously, being a lawyer comes with a lot of choices. And maybe sometimes it's hard to make those choices, but you will make them with the guidance that you get in law school as to how you want to use the power of the law, in what realm, on whose behalf you want to use that power. So the cognate to power and opportunity, maybe you already see this coming, is responsibility. 
The law is not just a job, it's a learned profession. And when you are entrusted with this knowledge and this power, you are entrusted with a public trust. The license to practice law is a license to do good and fulfill public obligations, as well as to work for private gain and personal glory. There is no single path as to how you discharge that public trust, whether you do it in your day job or not in your day job, whether you do it through philanthropy or service, but all paths flow through your understanding of yourself as a person who holds this trust, that you are an active participant in the law and in the governance and leadership of American society, American legal profession, American business, and in fact, in the larger global community. There is no better place than UVA Law School to become this kind of lawyer, to have access to the opportunity to understand the power of the law and to exercise it responsibly. You already know all the major basic reasons why that's true. The amazing faculty, the incredible staff, the deeply impressive students, our wonderful curriculum, I love this place. It's an amazing place for all those reasons. But more than that, and I hope that you already know this too, the faculty, the staff, and the students here are all engaged in a larger shared enterprise beyond the formal curriculum, beyond the process of professionalization that you are beginning. And it's an enterprise that never loses sight of the importance of humanity, respect, relationships to both the educational process that you're in now and to the workings of the law that you are going to enter. We all come from different backgrounds. We're going different places. We have different experiences, views, attitudes, interests, hopes, and dreams. I will ask you more than once, what are your hopes and dreams? Don't ever forget to ask yourself, what are my hopes and dreams? But we are all here because we all aspire to a real intellectual, pedagogical, and professional community that fosters and honors dialogue across difference. The people around you, I was thinking of starting this speech and I don't, just don't know if you all watch these movies anymore. You know, look to your right, look to your left. One of you, okay. So I say, look to your right, look to your left. These are going to be your friends, your colleagues, your networks. That's what the real thing is, right? Um, and, and, and that doesn't mean that you will agree. And one of the enduring visions I have when I think about UVA Law School and dialogue is um, a man and a woman who were in the same small section. Uh, they were friends, nothing romantic. And uh, they were in a, a class that I taught in my home with my husband about work-family balance and we had a, a chair and a half you know where a couple is supposed to sit and watch a movie together uh, and they would sit in this chair and a half these two friends every week they'd been friends for three years and they would disagree about everything and they would sit there scrunched together and they would look at each other and they would look and they would try to get other people to agree with them and they'd look at each other and they'd laugh and they'd laugh and they'd disagree again and again and again and that is the kind of dialogue you want and you need a dialogue Dialogue with respect, affection, empathy, humanity, and difference, right? So don't ever think that disagreement is somehow uncollegial. Disagreement is not uncollegial. It's healthy when it's done in the right spirit, which is the spirit that I think we foster here. And the relationships that you make here are relationships that you will cherish forever. Relationships with each other, with the faculty, with the staff. Last week was on grounds interviews, and as our alums came back to interview our new students, they walked in the building and they hugged everyone. They hugged me, they hugged professors. Jennifer Holvey's back there nodding her head. They hugged Jennifer Holvey. They hugged Cordell Fogg. I don't know that that happens everywhere, but that happens here and it happens here for a reason because there's a lot of joy here and there's a lot of humanity here. So in other words, becoming a lawyer is about both what goes on inside the classroom and outside of it. And you will leave here, I hope, both a better lawyer and a better person. A person and a lawyer with judgment, perspective, imagination, dignity, empathy, integrity, and leadership. And I have long felt the privilege of teaching at a law school that prizes all those things. And I am so honored to be the dean of this law school for all those reasons. And I feel that privilege even more. Uh, a few months ago, just before I became the dean, I was walking through the halls with my son, and we passed a student, and I said hi, and he said to me, he's 10, he said, Mommy, is that one of your students? And I said, no, because it wasn't someone that I had taught 
personally. And then I suddenly thought, that's the wrong answer. And I revised my answer and I said, yes, they're all my students now, right? Every one of you is my student and I am proud of you already just for who you are and for being here. And I will say, I think of all of the alumni as my alumni, even though, like Daisha Duin, I can't take any credit for what they have done in the world. I am so proud to call them my alumni, to call all of the UVA law family uh, my own. People laugh at me, some of you may be laughing at me when I talk this way. Um, my husband jokes that I love lawyers. Well, he's a lawyer, so that's very self-serving for him. Uh, but it's true, it's really true. You know, It's been uh, uh, more than a decade of, of being a lawyer, of teaching lawyers, of writing about and researching lawyers, and now leading an institution where we educate lawyers. I think I know lawyers pretty well, and I do love lawyers. I also have a pretty good feeling about you all, by the way. Um, but it's not just love it's also uh, faith. It's hokey. I know it's hokey, but I'm a very sincere person. My, my kids call me an enthusiast, and I am. I believe in lawyers, and being a dean is both a privilege and a responsibility for me. I believe in the power of the law. I believe in a legal education that prepares you for every opportunity you can imagine and every responsibility you will encounter. I believe in you. So my 14 years at this law school has only reaffirmed those beliefs. This is such an amazing place to begin your careers. I am so excited for you. Welcome to the family.